It's time for the Daily Planet Podcast Show. So sit back, relax, and give us a go. Scott and Matt and maybe a guest undertaking an epic pod quest. We're gonna ramble on about movies and books and television and directors and film festivals and this really long list of stuff that I know nothing about, but they gave it to me and they really wanted me to read through it. And that's all I can really say about it, but it's gonna be great. show. Hello and welcome to episode four of the Kryptonian Collection, our monthly continuing series where we get together and discuss, argue, and finally vote on whether movies should be granted entrance into the illustrious Kryptonian Collection, a list of the greatest films our meager planet has to offer. My name is Scott Daly, I am your host, and one of uh, the votes that will get to, be, to get to take place today, I am also joined by permanent council member Matt Freeman, who has one of the other two votes. Uh, Matt, how are you doing this week? Doing great, Scott. I'm uh, looking forward to this discussion because this is one of the types of movies that I like to see on the Kryptonian collection where there's going to be some, some disagreement, but I'm not going to spoil it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I am very excited for this, too. Um, I think this was a very interesting movie picked. Um, we are also joined by our, our third member of the collection of, of the sorry of the council, Chad Acevedo. Chad, welcome back. Happy to be back. Chad's movie, Silence of the Lambs, got in last month with a vote of uh, two votes to one. Um, so the rules dictate that Chad now has a seat on the council and will retain that seat as long as someone doesn't kick him out of it. And there is a person here today that might kick him out of it. Um, who, is, who is that person? That's Daniel Freeman. Welcome back to the, sh the show, Daniel. Well, thank you for having me once again. Yeah, this is the first time you've, you've nominated a movie for the collection. Um, so hopefully you won't let us all down. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully you're not the first failure. Yeah, that's true. Because we're we're three, we're three for three right now. So it would be all Daniel's oh, great. fault. Great. <laughs> no, no pressure or anything. No pressure. So uh, as I mentioned briefly above, the rules of the Kryptonian collection are pretty simple. Our challenger Daniel will put forth his movie and his argument for including it. Uh, the council and our challenger will then discuss, debate, argue the film and its merits or flaws. Um, and once that discussion is complete, the council members, the three of us, will vote. Each member gets one vote, and if the film re receives at least two yes votes, it is into the collection. Um, our challenger, Daniel, also gets a seat on the council, kicking Chad off, and he will join us next month for whatever film we're going to be talking about then. But if, for whatever reason, the film does not get the required two votes, it is rejected and forever banned from consideration. So this is this is the movie's Dang, one is, and only is, shot. This is so stressful. Yeah, you you are not banned, Daniel. Just your movie. You are welcome back. <laughs> well, it's to try. It's to almost perform. like being being denied by proxy. Like <laughs> like my opinion is just horrible or something. No, we have just have very high standards here, so we need to okay. make sure that the films are of the utmost quality, <laughs> which so far they have been. So on that note, Daniel, what film would you like to nominate for entrance into the Kryptonian collection this week, month? I, I, I nominate the film Red Belt by David Mamet. Uh, so this is, this is actually a film I really like, although it has been a while since I've seen it. Um, unfortunately, my internet decided to die this week, so I couldn't rewatch it. Um, but it's, it's roughly about uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor's uh, character, Mike running a kind of failed dojo. He's a, he's a martial arts teacher. And it, it follows kind of a, a winding story about his interactions with a kind of a, a, a woman and a, a police officer and kind of a, a misunderstanding, which kind of breeds further drama. And then he kind of gets even more intertwined in kind of a, a criminal under underworld sort of story. Um, but it, it's, at kind of at a distance, it's it's just a, a story about his character and him kind of overcoming different sorts of problems and, and kind of his his samurai kind of honor code being tested by uh, a very strange world that he kind of is is finding hard to to live in as evidenced by his dojo kind of not really functioning anymore. Um, but it, it's it's very it's very character driven. I would say the the, the plot is kind of winding and and almost confusing and the ending is even stranger in my opinion um but i i really enjoy the story because of the characters in the story i actually i really like david mammoth's dialogue but that's 
may be a controversial statement. Um, and also, I think the fighting is pretty cool, but that's just because I grew up doing like martial arts stuff. So that is my elevator pitch for Red Belt. All right. Um, and the other reason, of course, being that um, you are related to a member on the council and you happen to know that he loves this movie. So you're using <laughs> this knowledge to your advantage <laughs> to to manipulate a Although member I, of the council. I'm well, not sure if Daniel knew that I love this movie, but it is true. Of course, there's no I, way he I, didn't. I probably could have guessed. There's no way. There's no way you didn't have a conversation about this movie at least once. <laughs> I, mean, I think we probably saw it together, but I mean, it's <laughs> about martial arts, so yeah. yeah. Just wondering, how recently has it been since y'all seen it? <laughs> I, I, um, I watched it last night. Okay, All I right. I saw it probably two years ago, but I, okay. I I I've seen it very many times, so like I right. I know I know the movie. All right. All right. I, I, go no, ahead. no, go ahead. I was saying I, I wish I had had a little extra time to watch it a second or third time. I, I really do enjoy uh, Mehmet's dialogue. I think his his work tend to improve upon the you know, multiple watchings or multiple viewings. Yeah. Uh, so Matt, um, you you like this movie? Why don't you talk about your feelings <laughs> of this movie? Yeah, Scott Before said we... accusatorily. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm leaving my opinion out of this yet. I'm not saying anything. Yeah. Um. I. I kind of along the line Daniel said I really like this movie as as a character study of this guy and his his being tested basically like he's he's this very um he has this very rigid sense of right and wrong and and the movie just keeps making things worse and worse for him and taking more and more things away from him and you really think like it, it gets you know pretty pretty brutal at a certain point where like are we, we're doing spoilers right we always do spoilers on the yeah. Kryptonian collection right so at a certain point his wife like betrays him um because she thinks he's you know not able to take care of her anymore right, right. so I, I i like i like that line of thought actually that he's 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 basically always trying to make the right decision at every step of this movie and he basically only gets destroyed like even though he's doing the right thing, you can't really point at any individual thing that his character does. That's like, oh, that was stupid. He's just he's just very like honorable, almost like Ned Stark honorable, but probably more trope aware than Ned Stark. Um, <laughs> and in the process, he just kind of gets right. Like I said, he just he loses repeatedly, and things just keep getting worse and worse until the end of the movie, where it's just it's just kind of a mess. <laughs> That's a very interesting word you just used. I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, <laughs> First, I want to go to Chad, and I want to get Chad's overall opinion of the film. Well, uh, I'll uh, I'll start with the things I liked. You know, I mean, I I really like, uh, like I said, Bitman's dialogue. I really like that kind of laconic, uh, neat delivery that almost all of his his uh, films have. Uh, Ricky Jay is an American treasure, <laughs> and I, I did like uh, Ed O'Neill popping out of nowhere. Uh, getting to see David Paymer play a Lone Shark again was is funny. And I think probably one of the things I really enjoyed about it, and I'm not sure if it was unexpected or or unintentional, but how much it was about kind of economic anxiety. And this, but this is pre-crisis, so it's kind of interesting to look into the lens of this is I think early 2008. So things are starting to get starting to fall apart. I don't think anyone knew that we're about to go over a cliff, but uh, kind of looking through the lens of this is pre-2009. So I, I thought that was a very kind of interesting piece of the film. Not sure if that was intentional on Mammoth's part. I don't think he. I don't, I don't think he knew. That Layman was going to fail six months later, but still very interesting to watch. Mo- I mean, most of the I mean, the the primary issue or his Mike's issue is that he can't make money. I mean, it was just driven by his kind of his somewhat uh, I would say over the tops his uh, his strict code of honor. Yeah, um, I really loved a lot of the, the dialogue. Some great uh, some great one liners. If I was a, a high school football or wrestling coach, I would make my. Uh, players watch it you know things like embrace it or deflect it that's uh th- those are great uh to sound like coachisms but overall it just didn't the plot didn't make sense <laughs> i kind of it kind of i got i want i really came in wanting to like it uh I, like i said i like mammoth but uh, to tell led you for does the best american accent of any british man alive and he also he really i think he does a great job with the dialogue I mean, he does uh, it's kind of toothsome is another way I'd put it like he really kind of chews it up but overall man it just didn't make sense uh, I, the the plot 
it's and I, I hate to I hate to complain about plots not making sense because I love Christopher Nolan films, but <laughs> each each step it just as it as it kind of works its way forward, especially in that third act, like I don't think they thought it through. <laughs> they had the progression of things that would have to happen to, to really set up that third act. And the kind of the uh, on the nose that there was a magician in the first ten minutes switching a white and red dye or a white and black dye. Uh, it was just very, very odd. But uh I enjoyed it. I just didn't I just didn't think it was very good. I'll yeah. I'll definitely say that um my my first viewing of the movie I found the plot super confusing. Um and upon future viewings everything everything was okay up until the end, and then the very end is just still confusing to me. But um, like it, it, like it's it's character driven. So the the it's like I know it's sort of an excuse, but I don't I don't think the movie tries to make the plot be sensical. Like it's it is it, it has an internal consistency, but it's not really important. Like how it gets from point A to point B, it's just kind of like, and and it's not actually trying to spell out kind of in a in a traditional way. Like here is here is the plot. Here is the next thing that happens. It's just kind of thing, things happening things happening to the character. And then, and then you know, there's this crazy thing that happens at the end. I, I but, felt that the plot made sense. It was just improbable. Is, is that fair? Yeah. Do you really? Do you guys really think the plot literally didn't make sense? I, I don't think it made any sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I agree with improbable. I, I think the plot makes sense up until the end, the, the very it, end, rather. So, so it, you know, it, it's it, obviously I'm not going to dismiss it when smart people tell me that that something didn't make sense to them. Um, Maybe it maybe it does require repeat viewing so that you so that you like notice certain things. But I, I would I would ask like what aspects did you find to be the most um, ridiculous? Well, um, I, I can get into that. I just wanted to. I've been holding back my opinion to letting all you guys uh, talk because I think I'm probably going to be the most negative person here. Um, oh. I. Uh, I, I really like David Mamet. Um, I like some of his earlier work. I, I enjoy the, the Mamet dialogue. Um, I'm happy that this movie was nominated because I, when we set up this collection, Matt, I think the goal was to bring movies that um, we never would have thought of. I mean, everyone thinks of the, the Citizen Canes when you're talking about greatest movies ever, but I want to bring in movies that that people maybe never would have thought about. Um, so this was cool, and I had never seen this movie, so I got to experience a new movie. Um, I don't like this movie at all. <laughs> I really don't. And I like. I think over. I, I didn't like it while I was watching it, and I think even thinking about it afterwards, I've liked it less and less. Um, I think the, the the talking about it as a character study is true, except for Mike Terry is really the only character in this. Um, everyone else is is two dimensional, non defined shells of characters that um, they don't really want to spend any time developing. Um, it, it's it's just focusing on him and it doesn't have time for anything else. It doesn't have time for the story. Um, I just, I just did not like this movie. Um, and that now we can get into exactly why the story doesn't work. Um, and I'll, I'll let someone else go first before I jump in. Chad, if you want to go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I think the, it kind of lost me in the, uh, the, I don't, I don't know if it was all supposed to be random and that, you know, he gets a watch as a gift, gives that gift to a friend that kind of sets everything in motion for these, these group of nefarious characters who somehow know each other to want to take this random idea away from Mike. It's I, that kind of, uh, that's, that really uh, threw me for a loop. It yeah. seemed like this, there's this big, there's like this group, these group of, group of powerful men that want to take a, what doesn't really seem like an idea you could patent away from someone which i, I guess if you know if, if the point is it's not really about what gets you there it's just seeing how this, this is how mike's gonna do how mike's gonna gonna handle these situations yeah but so so what was their scheme what was the end goal of their scheme was it to get this training method was it to force him to fight like what was it and what events in the movie directly led to this or were just random happenstance or were some part of I mean, nefarious plan so... Should I take a stab because I just watched it? I mean, I you should go for it. it, it yeah, okay, because I I feel like um, I couldn't have answered those questions until I rewatched it. Um, so I think th this is my breakdown. Um, the uh, Tim Allen movie star, um, you know, told his his friend 
who is the guy who looks like Ray Romano, to um, to like take care of of uh, Terry, Mike, Mike Terry, and that guy gave him the watch, which he had bought himself, and he didn't know that it was stolen. And then Mike gives it to his his friend, the cop, and his, the, the the cop pawns it, and it turns out to be stolen. So this implicates um, Tim Allen's, you know conciliary in in theft in some way so that's why he just leaves the dinner rudely and never comes back because he's like screw this guy like there's no there's no net benefit to me interacting with him anymore even though even though tim allen likes him i'm just gonna get out of here and at this point he's already told uh tim allen and and the other guy who's who is involved in fight promoting and and uh, you know ufc or whatever they call it about his his training method involving the marbles so that guy has already like given that information on to his other you know buddies who were in the ufc so it wasn't like a conspiracy to defraud him it was just like we're going to pass this we're we're just going to use this And, and it wasn't even a big deal at that point in time it became a big deal because then mike comes back and he's like you screwed me over with this watch and now i'm gonna like try to get something out of you because you you basically caused my friend to kill himself so i'm gonna try to legally you know get something back from you to pay for his wife's bills or something i may be getting things out of order actually because this is kind of confusing and and that's this is kind of my point is that we're confusing ourselves just trying to parse it all out and i I don't think the cat the cop joe collins killed himself just from the watch being stolen i think when he was notified by the lawyer that they are aware that he let someone who tried to shoot him with his own gun <laughs> earlier in the film, um, when they yes. let her go, like there's this whole subplot where they're going to, they're going to counter sue her and push <laughs> and have charges pushed against her and the cop because they hid this. And this is Emily Mortimer's character, Laura, I think her name was. Um, uh, so this, this whole thing yeah, is so, so- confusing. Yeah, it may have actually been so. The first the first money issue is that his wife gets a giant loan from a loan shark, and then the second money issue is that now he has to take care of his cop friend's wife, and that's what actually pushes him to finally choose to compete for money. Because prior to that, that that was like against his morals. So like he's already sort of breaking down and succumbing by doing this. Um, so yeah, I mean it's confusing. So at I, what point? I, 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 at what Go point ahead. did his wife betray him? Because we we hear about the money from the loan shark. Um, she the, the the famous couple that she was interacting with has completely cut them off. They gave they either changed their numbers or gave her bogus numbers to begin with. Then we learn later that she's betrayed him. The movie doesn't actually bother to let those two characters interact after that point. Like he, he's just told by, from someone else that your wife has betrayed you, and they don't talk the rest of the movie. It's really strange. Um, and, but what, well, what, what, at what point so, did that happen? And like that, that, I mean, I know like the movie sets up that she's frustrated with him because he doesn't earn any money and she's supporting them, but it never, it never seemed like it was going into a, a malicious type of disappointment in him until suddenly she's hanging out with the bad guys at the end of the film. And we're supposed to be like shocked that she's actually bad. And I was just like, wait, wait, what? Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely things like, like on this viewing, I was like, yeah, there's really no love in their relationship at all. But I don't remember thinking that the first time I saw it. So it is it is oh, it is relying on repeat viewings more than I may may, may realize. But um, yeah, like she she's like furious with him, basically. If anything, if anything, it's like a. Uh, um, a failure of the actress to convey how, how pissed off she's supposed to be with him. Like, cause I, I get the sense that even from the beginning, she's like fuming at him under the surface about how like he, he really doesn't care about making money. Like it, I don't even think his dojo is failing because of any reason other than like he keeps, he like gives people free lessons and doesn't care. Like he just doesn't care about money. He's just like, wants to be this pure guy who is like his image of the the red belt. I don't know. Yeah. I I just, I I just, I I think that, you know, 
if why didn't she just leave him? I mean, here, here's if there's no love in their relationship and she's the one supporting everything, she could just leave. And like, it doesn't, it just doesn't tie to me. Like, it doesn't make sense. Th- their whole yeah. relationship, his relationship with like every character. Like, I think the best relationship that's defined in the movie is between him and Joe Collins, the cop. Um, and that doesn't actually mm-hmm. surprise me with Mamet because that's kind of what he does is, is relationship between men. But, um, yeah. I don't, I don't know. It's just I mean, like, I, sorry, go ahead. I always, I always saw it as like, kind of like Matt was saying that his, his and his wife's relationship was already falling apart or at least was like loveless. And these, this, this series of events basically just pushed it over the edge. Like it, this never really like broke the realism for me. It was just like, and like what, I don't even remember, like, isn't, isn't the, the wife's brother like a character and like he's the he's also involved in this whole mess and well, it's he's the one that convinces her to like it, I, I, I it's both, both of her brothers both of his right? wives yeah yeah like, yeah they're, yeah well one of them is the actual like champion they're both the silver brothers one of them is just like a fight coordinator for him but the other ricardo is the actual um main guy who is one of the two fighting in the big title fight um who also is the person that uh mike terry fights at the very end of the movie yeah. A person we've yeah. never met before that moment, and it's some, supposed to be some triumphant fight over the bad guy who we'd never met at all until that, that point in the film. Um, the the end, like I I will argue that the first hour of this hour and a half film is pretty solid. It sets up some interesting things. I wanted to see where it goes. I just think the last half hour, everything just falls apart. Um, I I think there's a lot of good ideas sprinkled around this movie and they just don't come together into anything worthwhile. Um, Like the, the whole, I mean that whole final section where it's just a series of like shocking reveals followed up by some really intense fight, between our character and and someone we've never met before, followed by getting a, a special gold belt from another character we've never met before, followed by getting the the awesome red belt by another character we've never really seen before, we've just heard talked about tangentially to the story. I don't know, it's just like, it doesn't, all these things don't come together into anything, I feel. Um, he doesn't earn anything for his friend Joe Collins' wife, which is part of his motivation to even do the... Um, the, the fight in the first place um he has i guess he has a relationship with the lawyer girl now i i, I don't really understand that I, at all so like what what would you cla- like see i think of this movie as a tragedy so like what narrative arc were you expecting i guess because uh, i i wasn't really confused by by things as much as as you seem to like not like what ended up happening so i just i don't i don't know what happened like <laughs> so he the end, the end of the film is he finds out the whole uh, thing is rigged. The whole competition is rigged because the magician is slipping balls out. Um, <laughs> and then he storms out. He's ready to quit. He finds the lawyer girl outside smoking. She slaps him. And then he turns around and goes back inside. I didn't get that. Um, well, so like it's he's basically he's he's been continuously tested repeatedly throughout the movie and he's he's just done like the right thing continuously throughout the movie and he's lost repeatedly continuously throughout the movie and he's basically just fed up and tired at the end so he's 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 about to quit so he like goes out and he's like I'm quitting and she slaps him and then he does he does the right thing once again but it's like I, I still don't really think of the ending as triumphant it's like he's he's continuing to do the right thing but it's like he's like too pure for this world. He's, he's, you don't, you don't think that the guy he basically worshiped as a God, giving him the red belt is a triumphant moment. I, I think it's like bittersweet. Cause it's like, does he really feel like he deserves that? Like it's, it's, it's I, sort I, of triumphant, but at the same time, it's like, there's this whole entire world is completely broken still. Like he hasn't really won anything. He's just won the respect of this one guy. The guy, well, I mean, he worshiped, I, think... I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, my my perspective on it is that is that he, it's so important to him that he see himself as this honorable guy, and he's acknowledged by the the founder of the art as like the worthy successor and custodian of the art. So that's like all he ever wanted, and that's why like he doesn't even react when the guy gives him the gold championship belt, and then he like breaks down for the first time in the movie when he gets the red belt. Um, so so I definitely thought that was like that was all he wanted out of life was, was 
acknowledgement, maybe? I don't know. But do you, but do you think that was earned through the movie? I mean, like, he earned the red belt by going back in and, and beating up, like, and competing. I mean, not, not technically competing, but, but fighting uh, Silva and defeating him. I don't know. I just. I mean, it, well, it's, it, it it's was, basically him. It's it's him saying this is all a travesty. Like, and he he was basically saying like, yeah, shut it down. This is this is this is over. And I mean, the red belt guy is sitting there, and this is of course what he's thinking on the inside. It's like this is this is not what I what martial arts is about. And then he sees this other guy stopping it. So it's like, yeah, it's. I mean, that, I, it was. I I will admit that it was clumsy. Like the ending was very clumsy. But I that was clear to me that like, that's that's what the red belt guy saw in him. Because I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think that I think that that is what the movie intends. I agree. I just don't think that that's set up in what we watched. I mean, the, all that the red belt guy saw him do was beat up someone else outside the ring instead of inside the ring. Like, I don't know. I don't know how you take that and draw this grand conclusion about how he's there to shut everything down and he's gonna. He everything is corrupt and he's the per, only one that can expose it for what it really is i mean he just saw the guy fight and i, I don't i don't know i i just it just nothing nothing felt like it came together to a final earned moment to me like i, I couldn't believe that was the end of the film when it happened and, and i'll agree that the shot itself is really great the shot of him you know matt mentioned this when we were talking earlier that he gets this belt that we've know we know has been valued at a quarter of a million dollars and just turns it aside immediately to to get up um in the uh in the ring um and then is handed the red belt from and then that's the like that shot is really beautiful how it's shot um is great but i just the moment didn't feel like that's where everything was leading to to me where did you think it was leading i have no idea i mean at this point i had no idea what the movie was doing i i <laughs> the, the last half hour i was like what have i been watching like there's all these little strands of of shady dealings and and all this stuff that like there's this whole interaction between him and emily mortimer's character where he cures her fear of rape in a 10 minute session of of, of I, 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 I don't know. It's just like there's there were so many strings I felt that were just laid out and they never were never tied up. So I, I didn't know where it was going. OK, Chad, 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 did you find the, the final shot or the final sequence to be moving at all? Or was it just completely inert to you? I, uh, you know, he's uh, he's a strong enough actor. I think you care about nice character by the end you're happy for him but still it's just very confused like i just didn't other than the professor giving him the red belt i was like oh that's that's really nice but he's still his wife left him and he's broke and he's oh three grand to a loan shark i i and like, there's there's been all this betrayal around him i i was I, it was very odd i i guess maybe i think most of mammoth's film there's less he doesn't maybe there's not as much resolution in his film it's more just about the dialogue and trying to have some sort of resolution or hoping for that may have been too much. I don't know. I, I, uh, mostly, I guess, you know, if I had to circle back around other positive things, got to see, uh, got to see Jake Johnson get beaten up, which was funny. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> believe he was playing a tough it's guy good. in this movie. I couldn't believe no, it. I looked at his character. It's Guaya Berra shirt, man. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> just, <laughs> just asshole frat guy in a bar. That was Excellent. possibly the, that's pretty fantastic. Well, it, it isn't Mamet sort of historically obsessed with like men and the relationships between men and what a man is. Is that is that yeah. Mamet or am I thinking of someone else? No, you're you're, yeah. you're right. So, so I mean, on, on on that note, this is like a super Mamet film because like you could say like this character is what a man is. Like he just sacrifices and sacrifices, and he doesn't he doesn't win like the point is that he did the right thing and i guess he gets a consolation prize which is really all he cares about anyway so i, I don't know i feel like this is yet another like lens on mammoth's take on masculinity and i happen to be susceptible to it for i don't know whatever reason like i love martial arts and i love the idea of honor even though like i am fully like aware of how ridiculous that sounds coming from someone in my like time and place 
but like I've always thought it was a very cool idea in fiction at least. So like this movie kind of pushes a lot of the right buttons for me personally. I, I'm I'm also able to reflect on that and be like, yeah, that's kind of it's kind of silly, but I still like it. No, and and I do agree with you that I think there's something to that. Um, and I think like like I said, the relationship between Mike Terry and and Joe Collins is probably the most interesting through line of the movie to me, um, how this guy looks, looks up to him so much. And it's, it's through his loyalty to the, um, to the place that, that he takes his own life and, and kind of ruins his wife's life. And, and there's this, this level of guilt that Mike Terry feels that forces him to briefly go against his, um, what he believes in. But then, then the end of that story is, him choosing to do the right thing, which is kind of what led to Joe Collins's suicide in the first place. Um, so it's like, again, and I guess, it, again, it depends on if you see this as a triumphant moment or, or not. And I, I just felt like it was filmed as such. I just feel like the end is saying that, um, Joe Collins did the right thing because he stayed loyal to respecting the, the image of their, their gym. I don't know. I just, I, I, I think there's something between that relationship well, and I wish the film was about that relationship. And if, if, if the main and only motivation of what he did was because of what happened to Joe and not this, this other convoluted side stuff with the technique that they stole from him and his wife and all this other stuff, I wish they would have just taken that out and focused just on this relationship between these men. Yeah, actually I think that might've been a, a cleaner story, honestly. Um, not saying I didn't like this movie, but but then they could have focused more on them and spent more time on them. Yeah, so I guess like what is – and I, I, I understand that it's – by having all these different things happen to him, it's kind of showing how much the world at large is beating back against him. But what specifically do you think that the the training method being stolen from him – had to do with the overall message of the film. Like, was that a part that really needed to happen? Was there was this, this break in the film where it's a, a whole scene in a law office where it's kind of switches to a law procedural where they're arguing precedent and, and law jargon for five minutes. I mean, I, I think it's just like, it, it's just a device. Like it, it Really, all the movie is trying to say is that, like, it's it's this guy sort of entering a world that he's not really a part of. Like, I, I don't have a good way to, to, to verbalize this, I guess. But the, the reason none of that really took me out of the movie, I suppose, is because it's like he, he's just he's just dealing with dirty people. Like, he, he's dealing with people that that don't really fight fair and are 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 not honorable in any sense they're they're the sort of people that would just steal his method to use it in a movie and and he's trying to 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 write things through like the legal the legal right way but it i mean it doesn't really even work for him right it's just he he just keeps getting screwed by these people so yeah. i i just i don't i don't understand what's what's actually takes what's weird about that like this 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 worked perfectly for me so this is why i'm just confused <laughs> I, I, I like your early comparison to a samurai, like because it's fun to think of him as someone who is, like, actually like unfit to live in modern society, like like a samurai transported from the past, and and he's forced to deal with all these shady people who are, um, okay, actually that gives me an opportunity to sort sort of shift and focus on something, um, that that I actually liked, like, okay, so so the part where he finds out that it's all, uh that the fight is, is rigged and he's, and he's going to go bl blow it. Um, what starts to happen is all of the like men who he's been interacting with, who've been sort of like mocking and talking down to him. At first they're very superior and they're like, God, you're ridiculous. You know, you're, 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 you're but then the, the, like their, their tone and the things they're saying start sounding increasingly desperate and they look like like they have this sort of like terror on their face. And my interpretation of that was always that he's finally showing them, like, sorry to be the patriarchy, but he's finally showing them like what a man is and like how a man is supposed to behave. And they're and they're like seeing how far how far short they fall. And and that's like those scenes are actually they're like they're not necessarily desperate because 
they're going to be ruined when he exposes them. They're desperate because they like see what pieces of garbage they are. Finally, I don't know if anybody else saw it that way. Maybe that's me projecting. No, but it's it's definitely like they're they're over, very extremely like overly defensive when yeah. when he starts fighting back and right. And that's definitely in contrast with his, like, you know, perfect, honorable calm at all times where he just begins wrecking everyone. Yeah, like they, they can't just they can't just tell him not to do it. They have to tell him that he's ridiculous for wanting to be honorable. So, like, th- th- that's exactly right, Daniel. They come off as, like, super defensive. And so that's just the theme of the movie at work, I think. Well, OK, he is kind of ridiculous, though. Like, I mean, I, I. I... I think it's it's very noble to be an honorable person, but he he's also a person running a business and there there gets to a point and I think maybe where this movie just loses me in the beginning is like like he's he's letting people down by acting the way he is. He's letting down his wife. Um he's letting down the cop who who looks up to him as like worships him by by acting the way he is and at a certain point you have to realize that you have responsibilities in this life and like you can't just just stick to this this honorable code that says I'm going to be poor forever because I don't want to take money from people. Um, I I like the point in the movie where they don't turn in the woman for what was clearly an accident with the gun. I liked that point, but every other moment it seems like he his doing the honorable thing and and it's it's very clear cut. Like when when they're they're fixing matches, yeah, that's very clear cut. That's you shouldn't do that. Like he he's in the right there, but in the other, like every every other decision it seems they makes is just like the honorable thing is intentionally hurting the people they care about him, and that's that's kind of frustrating to watch. Yeah, I, I mean, I think a Ned Stark comparison is actually fairly called for, and which Daniel already made, obviously, but like he's. You're right. It's it's not um, unambiguously one way or the other. Like we don't actually know. We don't actually know why his school is failing. We just get the sense that it's failing because he doesn't care about money, and and he doesn't really care about certain aspects of like modern life at all. And 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 yes, those can definitely be read as character flaws, and probably should be, because his character is so like intentionally one-dimensional i guess you could say like he, it, he he's drawn as a one-dimensional character on purpose because he, he really only cares about he using the word honor it's, it's more than honor it's it's like this particular image um of of like uh the sensei um yeah ned stark gets his head chopped off mac mike terry gets the red belt so i i think that's the difference to me is like you know. I, I don't like well, I mean, this is sort of why I was getting out of how this isn't. I mean, it's it's sort of a triumphant moment, but it's like, right? I think, like Chad said, it's it's still like he still has all of his problems, right? He he's just getting he's just getting recognition from the person he respects. He he he's still a samurai in a world that doesn't respect him. But to like, him, that's all that matters. So he got the one thing in the world he wanted. He was rewarded yeah, with and the one I, thing that he wanted. Um, right, but it, it's it's still. I mean, he still has to live in the world, right? Like, it's I, this is why I think it's it's kind of bittersweet. Like, he he is rewarded, yet he still has to live. He still has most of his problems, right? Like, I, I don't see that as like a, an, an overly happy conclusion. I just I just see that as him sticking to his morals and being rewarded for that. So do we but, do we think that he's going to because this do we think that he's going to sell the belt and then pay off all the debts? Like, is that I, I, the, not the red belt of the that's the, like completely completely out of his character so i mean oh well yeah the red belt he's not gonna sell i don't i don't no. know what he would do with the other belt i don't think he probably doesn't care for the money so I, yeah i kind of i kind of well he does have to take care of the the widow now so yeah. yeah so yeah i guess i guess it would be character consistent for him to sell the belt to take care of the widow well then all his so. problems are solved so there we go all his money problems are solved two hundred fifty thousand dollars so I I don't know I just <laughs> see this this is my problem with the film and, and that like it's just this character like are are we it seems like David Mamet is saying that this he he loves and respects this way of of living um, 
and he wants to glorify this guy and this character for this way of living. And I mean, isn't he really into martial arts, David Mamet? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah I, he's I actually really about... bad. Yeah, he, he'd been doing it for I guess like six or seven years before he made the film, so you yeah. can tell he he loves it. Yeah, so it seems to me like he he loves this pure image of martial arts, and he hates the UFC and and their corruption of of his beautiful sport. Uh, I, I just wanted to toss in like the, any scene where they have um, the announcers talking to the cameras. They're saying like the most inane, stupidest things, and it's hilarious actually. If you pay attention to what they're saying, it like doesn't make any sense. I, I don't know if anybody else notice what i'm talking about but yeah i, 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 I feel i feel like the, it, it had to have been an intentional like look at how stupid and and like like these guys are clowns like it, I, I didn't notice it the first time i saw it i noticed it this time i, I kind of picked up on that which which leads me to a question that i asked before we start recording why was anyone involved in ufc a part of this movie because like randy kotor p- plays a pretty big role as being this announcer guy in the movie why like this movie shits all over the UFC. It it shits over competitive fighting. It calls it all a joke that's fixed. Like I, I, I mean, just... I, I think I think you. This is not actually cognitive dissonance, right? Like you can you can be involved in the UFC world and still hate that parts that like large swaths of of like martial arts are fixed. Like this is this is ongoing, right? Like with the Olympic boxing medal, which was just like a total like joke. Like these these people want martial arts to be this sort of honorable sport, or at least, you know, some of them do. Andy Couture probably does. And it, it is still nonetheless a joke at the at the competitive level in, in yeah. any different sports. I think you're right, Daniel. I, I listen to an unusually large number of jujitsu based podcasts. Um <laughs> in, in, including <laughs> in, in, including the Jocko Willink podcast which I which I uh, mentioned recently. Um and they're all like like anyone who does any kind of Asian martial arts is is usually very weirdly serious about it. And I know from personal experience because they and I used to do Taekwondo and these guys are no exception. In fact, they're 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 way hyper in that direction because they're professionals um, and they really, you know, they don't see themselves as samurai necessarily, but they definitely have this like warrior mindset and you can see like that it would be very like like they're probably people who who basically you know the, the type of people who hate, who hate corruption and then some of them you know obviously do participate in that but they probably feel horribly guilty about it so i get the sense that it's it's not um i get the sense that it's a a very relevant issue for them i guess I, and also um like it's it's the fighters that they have involved in the movie and and like the fighters probably see themselves as the good guys although you know i I do take your point scott that isn't it you know randy couture does not really come off well in this movie like if you're because randy couture is basically playing randy couture and and he looks like kind of a coward because he just kind of walks away and avoids Mike when he's trying to get his attention. And that's it. That's the end of his character arc. So it, yeah. it is interesting to me that he, that he did that. I mean, yeah, that's probably a statement that like, there is, there is a problem like in this community, like not everyone, not everyone has the attitude that Mike's character has. And the point is that this is, this is the way that martial arts is supposed to be. So, I mean, it's, it's calling it out, right? Like it's, it's, it's very explicit, I think about that. So, so apparently there were two marketing campaigns for this movie. One of them was a normal marketing campaign for, you know, for, for sort of actually not normal, more like an artsy marketing campaign because it's mammoth. And then the other marketing campaign was strictly aimed at mixed martial arts fans. Um, which I think is funny because there's actually very little fighting in this movie relative to what you would expect from like an action movie. Yeah. And yeah. what there, and, and what there is, is actually filmed kind of weirdly. I, I don't know if this is a tangent that anyone wants to go with me on. Maybe Daniel does, but watching it this time in particular, I was actually kind of like, they're not really, they're filming this in a way where it's really obvious that none of these guys know what they're doing, or at least that, that the main character doesn't know what I, he's doing. I actually was about to, to shift to that topic. I, I wanted to talk about the filming of the action because uh, that final scene, the final fight 
is filmed so weirdly to me and how many times it cuts to angles like intentionally put there to to block what the action and you can't really tell what's going on how many times it shoots to long scenes many times it it cuts to other people's reactions to it seemed like to intentionally off off obscure god i can't speak um the fact that these people didn't really (laughs) know much about fighting yeah well on top of that my other thought was jujitsu like most martial arts is boring to watch because a jujitsu match is usually just two people locked in some kind of hold that is sort of a stalemate and then they and then they sort of wriggle basically to try to get advantage over each other and then there are sudden you know explosive changes in the situation every few minutes but like it wouldn't be this like um it wouldn't look the way it looks in the movie and and it never it never it never does so that's and and the reason is that like once you have someone in a hold they can't just like pop out of it so what, what's happening in the movie is they're getting each other into holds over and over again and then the camera cuts away and they're suddenly not in the hold anymore which allows the fight to continue um yeah yeah i so, mean so I, on, a, on a certain level i understand it and you know there's i mean any type of of action movie like around a sport like that like boxing movies even well-filmed boxing movies like creed like they're still adding adding drama to the what what normally would be a, a pretty not boring but like not super interesting action moment. Um, so like I can forgive that, but yeah, it did, it like that final scene like it kind of felt like everything was leading up to this fight, and then it seemed like the camera didn't want to show it. That's that's how it felt to me. Yeah, I I haven't again I haven't seen this in a while, but I I I don't remember it really. I don't remember this jumping out at me. Like I remember it being effective that almost every fight, I mean, no, like every fight until the last fight, Mike's character just basically immediately wins. And then it was effectively communicated in the final fight that these two guys were essentially equals. And, and that was nothing, nothing kind of broke my immersion, so to speak in, in, in that filming. But yeah, I should, I should definitely watch this again. Because... Well, yeah, I mean, it's one of these cases where I think it worked on me the first time because this was, like seven years ago or something and i probably yeah. knew a lot a lot less about fighting at the time and now i watch it and i'm like oh i see now um but um yeah anyway so let's let's talk about some of the performances really quick because um in an effort to to make sure i say at least a couple of positive things i do for the most part <laughs> really enjoy a lot of the actors in this movie. I mean, Chiwetel Ejiofor is great as this character. He plays it really, really well. Um, he is a by design one dimensional character, like Matt said, but he brings as much emotion and life to it as I think anyone could. And I think Chad said it earlier in the podcast that he, he does the mammoth speak really well. On the other, on the other side of the coin, I think Emily Mortimer's character, um, Really, I I do I did not like her performance at all. It felt really weird and stilted to me. I, I don't know how you guys thought of her. Yeah, I can, I can't argue with you. She can be really grating in a in a bad way at times. I like her; she's a great actress. But I usually do. She was not I, I usually do. Like her ca- yeah. her character here would just seem so weird to me. Um, and like again, I, I I I both see and don't see why she was included in this film. Um, but I don't think she did a very good job. And, and I think, you know, to her credit, I think Mammoth's dialogue is a little hard to act. Um, it's not, it's not necessarily normal speech, so it's, it's difficult to do. Um, but I don't know. I just, I just didn't like her character at all. What'd you guys think of Tim Allen? (laughs) I liked Tim Allen's character. (laughs) I mean, I think Tim Allen was basically playing Tim Allen, so... Yeah, that's that's what was so great. Yeah, I, I, I liked it. I, I love Tim Allen. Um, and I thought it was... I thought he did what he was supposed to do. I thought it worked, well, like, pretty well. And, and it's also interesting... Like, it's, it's always interesting when people choose to hire someone like that into a role like that, because part of the reason they're picking that person is because they want someone to, who is playing off type. Like you're you're hiring Tim Allen as an action star in a movie where you have Randy Couture. <laughs> yeah. So 
so clearly this is an intent you're you're choosing a comic actor to play an action star like that's you're trying to you're trying to cause some effect in the viewer and and i think it actually works because you sort of perceive the difference in your expectations rather than just what you're seeing so you, you expect him alan to be silly and he's actually just like this dour depressing person and i think that hits hard like it hits harder because it's tim allen does that make sense yeah i have a question that i just thought of because i was thinking of the the onset scene between him and tim allen when he when uh mike terry meets that other trainer um he he says did you tell him you were in the army and he said yes and he's like did you tell him what you did and he's like no that didn't that didn't go anywhere did it did i miss the reveal of what he did in the army no it's just it's just supposed to make him seem like a badass i got gotcha. you yeah. just just yeah. implying he's a badass so just 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 setting up stuff without payoff classic good writing <laughs> <laughs> Scott, now you're just being smug. <laughs> like I don't see. I I appreciate the. I don't. I don't want everything spelled out for me. Like I I think of that as like world building, where it's just like sprinkling little nuggets that might you know blossom into a beautiful story flower. But otherwise, it's just like in the background. I, I don't need. I don't need everything that is said in the movie to pay off at some point later in the movie. I think. I think that. Saying that he was in the army is world building. I think having someone guy some guy reference a specific thing that happened um, in his time in the army is a, a, an intentional setup that should either not be included or be paid off on. No, it's it's no. The point is that you're now you you wonder what is the thing that he did. Like I I don't want to be told what he did. That would completely ruin the entire point of that line. Like it's a checkoff I, gun. I, That's what it is. No, it's a it's like an unfired Chekhov's gun, or is it Chekhov's gun? Yeah, I guess it is. But like, no, it like you don't have to fire all of your Chekhov's guns. Like these things, I I personally think that works better, not explained. And I don't I don't know. I think that's just uh, we have differing opinions about how to enjoy movies. I guess so. Yeah, I'm, I I mean that's just one of many examples where the movie goes out of its way to hammer home that he's a badass because like really all you need if, if you're going for like utter economy is the scene where he he defeats everyone in the bar and then after he does it he like wants no credit he just wants to disappear and he's like nobody knows who i am i'm leaving yeah and then all like the, and then like everyone rewatches it on the tape like that to right. me is sufficient enough this guy is a freaking badass and the yeah. only reason why he doesn't win all this money in competitions is because he doesn't want to Right. And and then the movie the movie does like continually kind of hit that same beat a few more times unnecessarily and I, I'm not gonna say that that's bad though. I'm just like that's kind of I, am. I don't know. That's just a choice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh does anyone have anything else they want to talk about on this movie? So so actually yeah. maybe one one brief uh aside. How how much do you think Mammoth Speak is not like real speaking versus just being very different from traditional cinema speak. Cause I kind of feel like mammoth speak is mo- closer to like actual how conversations go than how like scripted dialogue is usually goes, but maybe that's uh, maybe, I don't know. I think they're probably kind of polar opposites. Whereas normal conversation would be somewhere in the middle, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, mammoth speak is lots of repetition, lots of interruption. Um, and, yeah. and weird emphasis and pauses, right? So, I mean, I think yeah. I think you're Take right. I, I think it is probably slightly closer to normal speak than um, what cinema dialogue is. Um, but I like I, with Emily Mortimer. I think when you're an actor, you're used to to doing cinema dialogue in a certain way. And, yeah. Um, so maybe if I said it was different than than normal speak, I, I misspoke. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I, I just wanted to because I, I mean I I like I like that axis more than I like the you know Shakespearean everything is projected as if in a soliloquy like kind of I I like things that sound more natural and and Mamet is one of the people that like versus something like Sorkin it's it, it sounds much more like normal humans talking to each other rather than something that's scripted yeah and which I think I appreciate yeah I mean I think it, it 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 depends on what kind of film you want to tell right I mean Mamet 
makes movies that are very grounded and kind of realistic and that type of dialogue works very well in those type of movies where, I mean, Sorkin is a good example. He likes to have characters tell like flowery, amazing speeches that inspire everyone and, and make me wish that the president of West Wing is the president of the United States. But, uh, <laughs> so I, I think it's just, it's just, it, it's depending, it's what you want to do with it. And, and yeah, I mean, Mammoth's dialogue works very well where it does. I mean, uh, while I've been ragging on this movie, I, I really like some of his, his screenwriting work. I mean, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross is, is an incredible film that I, I really love. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I've, I've been negative here, but I do like Mammoth. I just didn't feel like this was a, a good work for him. How do you feel about Spartan? Oh, it's been so long. I actually like, I like Spartan a lot. Uh, that part of the reason I wanted to see this was I like Spartan quite a bit. I think I've but, only but seen any that reason once to give, uh, a long time ago. Yeah. I think I own it on DVD if you can borrow it. <laughs> I forgot about that it. movie. It's a very similar arc with kind of certain permutations, but it's a very uh, stoic just... character who, who does the right thing and gets screwed over for it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. But yeah. All right, so are we are we ready to to vote, gentlemen, or is there? Do you want a one one last argument, Daniel, before we go to the vote? No, I'm I'm I've made my case. <laughs> All right, uh, Matt, why don't we let you go first? Well, I I've always liked this movie, and I've liked this movie for years, and it still works on me. So, like, while. Scott, you've made you've made a, a good sort of case against the movie that I that I really can't contradict. I think I think there's room in the in the Kryptonian uh, council for different aesthetic views, and I think that improves things. So I am going to to vote for the movie um, because it works for me. So, so that that's is a, my vote. So that's a yes. Yes. All right, Chad, you go. You go next. Uh, um. I feel bad saying it, but uh, I'm gonna have to say no. I, I I enjoyed it, but I think that there's a relatively high bar to clear, and I, I just don't think it paid it. All right. Um. So, <laughs> uh, there's not a lot of drama here because I think <laughs> I've made I've made my opinion pretty clear. Um, I'm I'm gonna vote no to. Um, I I like David Mamet, as I said. I think he's made. He's written a lot of good scripts and he's he's made some good films. I just don't think this is one of them. Um, and and I I appreciate what you guys are saying, and I I can see why you both really like this movie. I can. Um, I just I I don't think it's good enough um, to warrant entry into the collection. Um, I I I think that if we're gonna pick a David Mamet movie, there's there's better ones we could pick. Um, and I would love to see him in there one day, but I just don't think this is the movie. So. Yeah, and I really commend Daniel for suggesting this one because I, I knew when he said it, I was like, oh, this is going to be great because there's a lot good you can say about it, but there's also a lot you can say against it where it, it, it's just a weird it's just a weird movie. So I knew it was going to be a, a good uh, argument. Yeah, so, and, and I will say yeah. that I haven't seen a, a Mammoth-directed film in a long time, so I, I enjoyed getting to to look at his direction from a critical eye and, and I do, I do like it. I mean, I like the, his style. I like for the most part where he puts the camera and what he does with it. I actually think the opening of this film is really well done. Um, the first, I think that whole scene in the the dojo, the first part, I, I was very interested and I was very engaged with the film and it just kind of went downhill from there for me. Yeah. I was gonna say, definitely downhill. Um, so that's that. So with two vote, two no votes to one. I'm sorry, Daniel. Your film has been rejected. It's okay. You guys are wrong. <laughs> and that's why. I mean, that's why. You know, that's why we have three votes and three people. And um, it, it, I don't think it makes it a bad film. I'm not saying. Just, just, just you wait, Scott. I'll, I'll find my way under the council someday. And. <laughs> It will, it will be great. I, I hope so. Like that, that's the thing with this. As much as I, I didn't enjoy this film, I'm glad you nominated it. I'm glad I got to watch this film. I'm glad, I'm glad we got to have this conversation because this is what I wanted this to be. I wanted to 
to experience new films and have these conversations and, and listen to other people's point of views that I might not necessarily agree with. So I think, you know, the first few films that we picked, um, we didn't really, there wasn't really much argument, um, because like Jaws is a classic. We, that, that was kind of a setup <laughs> easy film. That's going to get in. Um, Silence of the Lambs is, is one of the greatest movies ever. Um, Raising Arizona was interesting, but it's also, uh, you know, the Coen. So, <laughs> it's it's a really really talented director so I'm, I'm glad i'm glad this happened um yeah i i just wanted you know just as a microcosm of this whole discussion i, I distinctly remember the first time i saw this movie um the, the you know the last the last shot happens where he gets the red belt and i and i like was like choking up and had tears in my eyes like that's how much it affected me the first time and i looked around the room at like whoever else was with me and everyone just like was either like completely bored or just not paying attention. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, what's uh, like in my head? Like, what's wrong with you people? Like, this was this was incredible. It's incredibly moving. And that just shows you, like, a movie can just not work on some people and work on other people. And it's it's not even. It's, yeah, it's, this you know this probably only works. Course. This probably only works because we did martial arts for a really long time. Yeah, and that's in, very, in that's hindsight very possible. now. That's very possible. But yeah, that, I, just, I just wanted to tell that story because it's, you know, the whole business of like judging the quality of a film, you have to hold, you know, you have to admit very quickly and upfront that different people have different like basic profiles of, of what appeals to them. So Yeah. All right. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and, and Matt, I've talked to you about this before, but I wanted to talk about it on air. Um, for, we've decided that um, this was the fourth episode of this. The fifth episode is coming next month, but we want to do a little bit of change up every, on every five episodes, where every five episodes, uh, a member of the, the council gets to nominate a film um, instead of having a challenger come in. So um, what we'll do there is have a member of the council this month, it's going to be me, um, nominate a film, and then we'll bring an old council member from one of the, the previous episodes in to be one of the votes, since obviously the person nominating the film shouldn't be able to vote. Um, so we're going to do that next month on, for episode five. And, and gentlemen, I already know what movie I am picking. I am picking what movie? the Wachowskis Speed Racer. Oh, please let me be <laughs> on the council. I mean, you're, you're I on it. I promise. You're on it. Oh, fant- oh God. I promise <laughs> I'm not going to shit all over that. <laughs> you have to watch it first, this, Chad. I, I know. The system I is know. rigged. The system is completely rigged. What? Wait, why is yeah. the system rigged? It's rigged. Why? It's all scam. You're incentivized to vote for a movie because you get to stay on the council if you're the third member. What? Rigged. No. It's rigged. No. No. Chad, no. did you? Oh, vote? did you just did join? You, did you vote no because because you wanted to stay on the council? No, no. I just I just didn't like it. Look, we have. That's exactly have, what he would say. We have integrity. <laughs> we have integrity here. Yeah. You're council. not honorable. <laughs> I uh, I actually have a I believe like a like a tangerine belt from when I was 12. Thank you very much. So. <laughs> I'm sorry, Daniel. I tried to, I tried to switch the, the black ball behind the scenes, but I'm not. <laughs> good enough. It's okay. I'll just, I'll just hold on to my red belt and won't give it to any of you. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So next month is going to be speed racer. I, I am very much looking forward to this. Um, I'm very much looking forward to, to being the Daniel of next episode where I'm telling all you guys why you're wrong and why this movie is incredible. Um, and we will, we will see what happens next month. I, I don't think we've decided who the fourth person we're bringing back on will be. Uh, we'll figure that out because we've got a whole month. But um, if you're listening at home and you want to um, get a, a head start, that's the film. It's it's the Wachowski Speed Racer. So that'll be next month. Um, Daniel, thank you so much for coming on and nominating your film. <laughs> I, I am I am sorry that you've lost, but them's the breaks. Um, There's. There's always another day. There Just is. keep doing the right thing, Scott. <laughs> do the right thing is a movie that we should nominate. There's, do, there's a good do the right thing. Uh, Chad, thanks for, for coming back. You you get to keep your seat for another month, which I don't know if that's a good thing for or a bad thing. Um, for, for, for your sake. Um, so <laughs> before we go, I wanted to start something new. And Matt, once again, you and I talked about this. I wanted to start doing like a, a question of the week. So at the end of each show, we'll ask a question that uh, our people, whoever is going to be on the podcast, the next week's episode will answer. Um, so my question of the week this week is what is your, your favorite um, director who 
made made a bad a really terrible film and then followed it up with a a really good film after that bad film so uh, this this question came to me because I actually like David Ayer uh, of Suicide Squad. I like his previous movies, and he just made a terrible film, so I'm really hoping he bounces back with his next film. Um, so, uh, Matt, you be thinking about this question, uh, since you will definitely be on next week's episode. Um, okay. And the people listening out there also be thinking, and if you want to submit your picks to us, you can do that uh, at uh, dailyplanetfilms at gmail.com or at our Twitter, at dailyplanetfilms. And uh, if we get some submissions, we will read them on the podcast. So I'm really yeah, interested. You can to see. also, Sorry, you can ahead. also go to our, I was just going to say, we also have a Facebook page that, that you can just put a comment on. So, Oh yeah, so. there you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's, I think that's just facebook.com slash daily planet films. I think. Yeah, that's it. So, um, once again, Daniel, Chad, thanks for coming on. Um, we want to do Twitter and where you can be found on the internet. Daniel, you can go ahead and go first. Sure. I am at the Berkeley Science Review. That is the main place to find me. All right. Chad, do you have an online presence anywhere that you yeah, want to share? Yes. Yeah, see Acevedo1982 on Twitter. Chad, you don't tweet enough. I, I, uh, I'm i just barely a millennial. So I don't think there's <laughs> a big piece of it. I don't, I, don't, I don't tweet much. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, Matt, how about you? On Twitter, at more than a mail. All right. Uh, I am also on Twitter at Scott Daily eighty five. I mentioned the our Daily Planet Films Twitter is at Daily Planet Films, um, and you can also support us on Patreon. Uh, that's Patreon dot com slash Daily Planet Films. Um, this podcast is free. We want to keep it that way. Um, we want to keep doing it. So any support you guys could be would be great. Um, Matt, I don't think I don't think there's anything else. Do we have any plans for next week? I don't think so. I don't think so. It might be a Phantom Zone episode, I think. I'll have to check our schedule. Okay. But we will certainly okay. post a, a tweet warning people on, on what is the next week's episode, if there's anything they want to watch in advance. Um, but that's it. That's, that's episode four of the Kryptonian Collection. Red Belt is a no. Sorry, Daniel. And we will see you all next week. Podcast. Just go away. Please come back next Friday.